Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk. This is part two with my friend, Bill Peckham. And we were talking a little bit about hobbies and how to stay positive with and live the fullest life possible with the kidney disease. So welcome to the show, Bill, to the second half. Yeah, part two. Well, you know, we were talking a little bit about living well with kidney disease, and you were talking about how you're a Hamilton junkie. No, Jan- I'm sorry, uh uh, groupie. Groupie. Yeah, because junkie has a bad word. Groupie. And um, can you tell us some of the other things that you've learned? You've you've traveled all over, but some of the other things that you've learned along your way about being healthy as a patient, just taking care of yourself. And you were talking about exercise with work and exercise is so important. And and for me, um, I gained the benefit of that from work. I mean, I was working on my feet. Um, you know, through the nineties, I'd say through the late nineties. And, uh, but, you know, as I gained in seniority and my job changed and I sat more and was on a computer more. And I, I remember I, did, I joined the gym in the two thousands and, but, um, you know, it's, it's something you just have to stay so on top of. And I never had a habit of real exercise. I, I mean, I had, uh, Walking the dog, like you said, having a dog. But, you know, in, and then when dogs age, all of a sudden you walk a lot less sometimes. And, and, uh, and you don't really even notice how, <clears throat> and so it can come to a point where, um, last summer I have a stand up paddleboard, an uh, inflatable stand up paddleboard, which is really fun in the lakes uh, around Seattle. And <laughs> I couldn't stand up. I mean, I could, I, I was like, you know, falling in the water, and I'd stand up and feel really wild. It, and uh, I was like, ah, you know. And then uh, after that, I um, noticed other things that I couldn't do. You know, I, I'd have to use my hands to get up. I couldn't couldn't get up from the floor with any dignity. I'd have to get over on my knees and everything. So I just started, and the, and then my um, ability to walk distances was going really down, and um. So I got a personal trainer and, and I really, um, you know, again, just thought to myself, how far can I take this when talking to him? It's like, let's see what we can do. And, uh, he's made a great deal of progress. And then I had a, a medical procedure that helped a lot, a stent to increase the blood flow to the uh, calf. And so that, um, is allowing me just to walk with less pain. You know, I'm just in a lot less pain, uh, from the exercise itself, I think, strengthening muscles, uh, but also just from this procedure. <laughs> it really has made a difference. So it's just so key, and, you know, and and, uh, and and it can come back, but it, it takes a lot of effort, and and it takes motivation, and uh, I, I don't really have a healthy motivation. I have might be unhealthy, but my mom really could have benefited from physical activity and exercise and having a personal trainer, and she certainly had the resources she could, she could afford that, and she didn't do it, and uh, and she was so generous with everyone else in her life, but not with herself. And uh, I'm probably still really mad about that, honestly, and uh, that she didn't do the things you have to do. And uh, so I I do them. I, that's the first money I spend every month is to uh, the gym membership and and two days a week with the personal trainer, and uh, just uh, at night stretching and doing my um, routines and. I mean, it's just that, and, and it's I, I'm much more engaged with it than I've been in the past, and I and it's and that you know that's my motivation. But I I think you know you, I, I I hope it doesn't have to come to that for everybody. But that's such a key part, especially as you start getting into these, you know, 28 years now on dialysis, and uh, we all know you know you you and I have been along around a long long enough time to to know vibrant. You know, active people who've, um, you know, who succumb to kidney disease. And so, you know, how far can you take it? How, how you know, what? How far can you take it? That's a great line. <laughs> and, and then something else that just came to me kind of in talking about this is, um, I told myself 
to be coachable. You know, I found a personal trainer who's been in it for 20 years. You know, I had confidence in him. And I just said, I'm going to sit here and do what he says. <laughs> you know? and, and it's like, I've, I've said that to doc, you know, in, in the case of doctors, when I found doctors, I really like, I'm just, well, I'll do what they say. And, and that's kind of the idea of, um, being coachable that, um, it, you don't have to be perfect out, out of the gate. But when you find these people, uh, who are willing to give you the benefit of their experience, who have had success, whether it's a nephrologist or a, a, a tech at the, the at the unit who said I could put my needles in, or um, or now Rob, my personal trainer, is that be coach. You know, you pick them. Okay, now now you got to listen to his expertise. <laughs> yeah, do it. And if you can't do it, be honest with them that it's you're struggling. And you know, I mean, it. it that's that's the relationship of a of a coach, and and there are person you know personal coaches. So it's a it's a term of use. But I, what I mean is just the the habit of of being able to incorporate advice and um, take direction. Take direction. Take direction. Yeah, try it. I mean, this is also new to us. I mean, I don't, I don't know anyone else in, outside of you know the community. But I mean, you, you know, that's constantly dealing with a chronic disease. I mean, so. Um, we have to listen to someone, <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly. those people and, you know, and, and, uh, uh, Lori Hartwell is a good person to start with. I mean, you know, you have to have hope. You have to, right. you have to, have have to engage, you know, you help have others. to be engaged with your care. You have to, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, you don't, and, that, and that's something, I don't know how you feel about this, but, um, lately my advocacy, uh, I've tried to really think about the um, the ninety percent of people who are on in center hemodialysis, and of that, the the majority who aren't engaged in their care. And really, when I'm talking to researchers, or is I, I want to remember that what those people want is to feel better without doing more. And it seems like when you hear me, I'm constantly talking about exercise more, eat more protein, you know, walk more, dialyze more, you know, do more, do more. And I know, um, you know, that that resonates with people, but, uh, and that's great. You should, but, um, but to the people who just want to feel better without doing more, you know, that's what the challenge should be to researchers. That's, you know, that's what we should be thinking about when we're trying to develop new ways of health, you know, providing health care going forward. Is well, you know, what's interesting to me is people, you know, you hear the topic, 90% of nephrologists would pick home dialysis or 98%, yep. whatever the number is. But it's it's really just an abstract question. Um, if you ask people, like, you know, would you eat well and exercise and brush your teeth every day? And, you know, like, yeah, sure. But when the rubber meets the road, do you actually do that? And and I, mm-hmm. I know I I really you know dislike that question you know that is put out there that ninety eight or whatever doctors said they would do home dialysis and they don't prescribe it for their patients. The other side of that is if only people had all the information, they would do this. You know that that's the missing ingredient. And and really and like you say, well. Actually, the the thing that's missing from the other, from the doctor side is it's not real to them. It's real to us, and uh, you know, easy to say in theory, but um, well, I I, think- I really believe that the the opportunity right now is to devise ways. I mean, RSN, myself, a, you know, all the advocacy. We spend a lot of time explaining the system to. Well, we should pay patients to care. do their own treatments. You know, well, um, I think what we need to do is explain <laughs> the people to the system. It's Ex- like we we dealing with all these, you know, it's all these anonymous interactions that when you're on dialysis, pretty much. I mean, occasionally you'll find a unit with a low turnover, but the, generally the people caring for us don't know us and and, and don't right. know what our medical goals are. I remember, um, remind me of his name, uh, who gave a presentation, RSN Talk, and um. Is saying the three things you would ask somebody and before even talking anything else. And then, you know, you'd wait and then have them come back and say what their three goals are, I think. And it was an approach to care. It was a, um, oh, it would have been 10 or 15 years ago now. 
<laughs> at good. RSN. I wish I could remember more about it. He had a book he wrote um, to... Uh, he was a, like a salesman, I think. I don't think he was in. Oh, was he? Uh, was he um, Jack Bernard? Yeah, My, yeah, yeah, Jack. He is the guy that we would bring on board to run the meetings, so they would be fun and exciting, and keep us all energized, so they wouldn't be a humdrum type of. It uh, might have been he was running it, and then somebody else was giving a talk about their approach to. To care. care. I, I would say, you know, I'd take well, better notes, and I could refer to him now, but. It was just the idea that, um, you know, the the doctor-patient relationship would be to help the patient realize what it is they want. Well, and I think one of the problems is, is uh, the chronicity of kidney disease. People start feeling bad, and they slowly, when they crash into dialysis because they're anemia or transplantation, they've already reestablished some of the things that they thought they could do. And so it's not like you were hit by a car and you were doing one thing one day and not doing it the next day. It's like you said, the slow progression of the illness. Uh, and then, you know, you often hear, wow, I didn't know I feel so bad after they've been dialyzed a few times. And they're like, oh, my God, I feel so much better. So there's this whole process leading up to, um, you know, to where your kidneys fail that you didn't realize how bad you felt it's the same thing when you get a transplant you're like oh my god I, I i didn't believe that i really felt that bad because we're like frogs in a boiling pot of water you know we're not really realizing that it's getting well, hotter jump out eventually the way <laughs> it's more like that Frogs will jump out. Oh, well, we need to stuff. learn how to jump out, you know, because and and but basically, I mean, it, say, it happens when you go to more frequent dialysis too. And you know, I'll tell you a solution. I think or an opportunity is actually with electronic medical records because right now, if you ever watch 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 somebody use it when they're taking care of you, and they'll they'll type the first few letters of your name probably. Um, I have to go maybe all the way to the W for you. Uh, you know, it just depends on how common the name is. And once they'll see your name, they'll click on it, and then that'll take them to a, a drop-down menu where they can select, select the procedure they want, and then that pops up, and they can enter your blood pressure or whatever they're doing. But they that that screen they're looking at is identical for every patient. It doesn't really say anything about you. If they don't know you, they don't know anything more about you after seeing that screen. But what if instead when they type those first few letters of your name, it took you to your page that you're, you curated and you had a photo, it was like a Facebook sort of page that a medical had a Facebook photo of page. You, yeah, that had a photo of you, you know, surrounded by family. Right away, that picture would tell so much about how you want to be seen and known. Right. Not that you're sick in front of them. This is how I want to be seen. You say what the goals are. The goals are I want to be able to garden every day. I want to continue volunteering, you know, whatever it is, they could ask, well, how's that going? You know, I mean, if if they could just have a little bit more information about you, if you could just explain yourself to them so they, they'd have more context to provide care, I, mean, well, I think that would be very powerful. And, and imagine how great the RSN conferences would be. We'd all get together and say, oh, what's a great thing to have on there? What's, a, you know, how did, how to, you know, when it, if you had patient reported outcomes, what, what patient reported outcomes were? really effective in, in uh, communicating, you know, the sort of care you need and want and hope for. And I mean, it, it just, uh, it would change that dynamic. And um, well, you know, I just think, you know, it just slow the EMR process down a beat and give people a chance to look at a screen okay. that introduces you to them. Well, you know, one of the things that's interesting, and I don't know if you've been following me on Facebook, but the, in the last year, year and a half, I started painting. And I love the artistic, you know, expression of, uh, and people have, you know, asked me to commission, make things. I mean, I didn't know that I had this artistic, I've always made jewelry and been creative, but I just picked up, started painting a while ago. And I guess I have, uh, I call myself an intuitive painter, but uh, I've entered some art shows and they want me to create an artist statement. And it's, it's very much the same. So I created an artist statement, you know, expressing who I am, what, what my background is, but it's in a... In People a, who are going to look yeah, at your art to know exactly. who you are. Yeah, to know who I am. And, you made it in. Exactly. And I'm like, you know, the same thing could be done for people with an illness. Like, what is your right? what is your statement? And when I see a new doctor, I give them a one-page history. I give them all my lab. I give them, you know, enough 
that they can leaf through it but not be overwhelmed. And, you know, maybe I'm going to add this little mission statement on the front. I of, think we uh, should. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, this I mean, is you who have I am. a primary doctor, right? And I think that should be between, you, you know, you and your primary doctor should talk a lot about this. But then when you go see a specialist or whatever, it's boom, right there. It's like Right. I agree with you. We're getting a little bit better with consolidated medical records. Um, but it's a hassle because I, I don't. I'm not in an integrated care system, and I, I want to choose my own doctors, so I, I make a choice to go see a cardiologist that's here, but a lot of our, uh, a lot of my doctors are in the Cedars-Sinai network, which is good because they can all pick the information up and see it on one screen, and that's just in, you know, in the last year that's happened, but I have like six portals that has medical information about me on it. And I just, I really agree with you that it should be identified to the patient and that should go to my portal and it should all link to one portal, not me having to... Just, that just should be where they start going into the, the electronic medical records. Just it, exactly. It should be owned by the patient. It shouldn't be owned yeah. by, it should and be owned by the patient. In an integrated system, because even if it's integrated, you go to see the dermatologist they're not going to read your whole kidney history, probably. I mean, you know, or they're not going to. But if they just had a page, it's like, oh, wow, okay, long-time patient. Go, oh, okay, wow, important oh, painting. Oh, interesting. Like, and all of a sudden, maybe the doc has an interest in painting, too. And it never come up. And all of a sudden, exactly. you have this great. The other thing that is, um, when you talk, when I, I've been talking to people, and it's like you could say, look, I like to be called Mr. Peckham. Or I really, I just want Bill. Or, you know, please use this pronoun or, I, or whatever. I mean, you could have the sort of pet peeves that are just like fingernails on a blackboard every time you go to a diocese. Just right there. Put, their, just like, put your likes just and dislikes. Just Mrs. Jones, <laughs> you know. And, and that's, you know, honey, no honey. Don't call me honey, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's just some, for some people, that's like the worst part of the experience, really, is that familiarity that... People assume, can assume, and other people welcome it. So uh, to have that as a spot where you could just describe your preferences and then conscientious medical staff would be able to quickly know that with a glance okay. without well, well, any Bill, awkwardness. You are a visionary like I am, and we'll be talking about this in five years. It probably won't happen, but it's good to put the idea out there because He's it's really it. patient-centered yeah. care. I have any, we don't have any way of actually doing this, but... Yeah, it's patient-centered care, and you know, I, I was having this conversation on one of a call about there's a nephrologist shortage, and there's, um, you know, any way that you can help the doctor feel more connected to patients is going to make them have a higher satisfaction. Uh, I spoke to my doctor yesterday, who took care of me when I was two years old, and um, you know, he's traveling to Europe. I mean, it's it's amazing. And, you know, we have this special bond with our long-term doctors. And how can we help, you know, the newer physicians come in, have a stronger bond to their patients and see them that they're, you know, people who have kidney disease. Um, you know, that's, we're just not a patient. And we're their patients. I like that term because I feel it's loving when I'm my doctor's patient. But beyond that, I'm a person who has an That's illness. That's the only way that it's literally true, though. Yeah, it's the, the only, only way is I'm people. their patient. Yeah, I'm their patient, yeah. but don't refer to me as a patient. And uh, <laughs> and it's a it's it's a great discussion to have. And um, you know, you've been such a, an incredible example because you've you've lived so long with this illness. You've taken an active role in. And it's not easy to be an advocate and, you know, read through all the the um, bills and try to figure out what's right, what's wrong. And and it takes a lot of dedication. Um, it takes a lot of dedication to, you know, be vigilant on doing dialysis as, as much as you do and the diet and exercise. And you're just a credible example to people who are living with kidney disease and, and a real inspiration. So thanks, Lori, and uh, back out yet. <laughs> <laughs> and so, it, just to conclude, we're, we're the old timers. I know there, there's not, there's not a lot of us around, but uh, uh, that I'm in contact with. I mean, I know there's more old timers out there that I'm not aware of that weren't in our circle initially. The um, so just to wrap up, um, so somebody's listening. And they're new to dialysis, and they want to travel, or they want to get engaged. What's the first thing that they need to do? Just 
I'm kind of putting you on the spot now, though. Uh, I think any steps you can take to the goal of being able to uh, put in your needles are going to be the um, really in, in really important for you to have uh, you know the best outcomes you can using dialysis. I just I really think that, and so the steps to get there, if if that's just a bridge too far right now, are you know tear your tapes, make sure you're washing your hand and arm as you enter the unit. Just kind of theatrically, so everybody knows it and does right. it as well. And do a Hamilton move with the arm in the air, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, <laughs> wave it around, and then uh, and then uh, you can uh, you know pull your own needles before you can put them in. It's easier because you can feel them come out, and that's when you press down the bandage. And you have help there, and you can learn to do it. Um, I, have, I think everyone who's tried, I've known, has been able to, and you just. These sort of steps and, and then, um, to really get into details, to really work on this cannulation, you can cannulate fruit. It's kind of similar and you try to get it between the orange and the rind and, and that's kind of what you're doing. You're, you're going through the skin and into the, into that tube, into that straw. So once you, if you can get there, that's really going to help you travel. But I think, you know, don't let that stop you because, uh, they can put in your needle just like they do for everyone else and uh, just make the effort to travel. And I, you know, I know there's bad travel experiences, but even those a year later are often the funniest ones and the ones you look back on, uh, you know, so I just say, uh, make the effort Just say, yes, I'm going to do this and, uh, and do it. Go, go out and, take that trip you have the opportunity to do. Great advice. Thank you, uh, Bill Peckham. It's been wonderful to chat with you, and I look forward to hearing about your future Hamilton uh, groupie experiences. (laughs) All right. Uh, I look forward to telling you. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.